um just a couple thank you so much um i will let you guys introduce yourselves as you see fit but just a couple housekeeping things um we do have this up on the screen in 108 for those who are in the building and after this presentation is over the zoom will end and we will have a very brief uh, meeting conclusion here in 108. So if you wanna wander down that way when the Zoom is over, you're welcome. If you're teleworking, um, we will send out minutes. So don't worry about that. But I think that's all I had. Um, let's go ahead and get started. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Kimberly Weitzman. I am the QA and training team lead um, for an agency called ViaQuest. I believe some of you probably work with us in one capacity or the other. Um, I'm here to give you a very um, brief introduction to about three different topics in one hour. So um, please keep that in mind. This is very introductory. Um, so if you would like a more detailed training about one or more of these items individually, by all means, please let us know. Um, this is something we do quite frequently. Um, we provide trainings not only to our own employees, but also to long-term care facilities that we work with. And we would be more than willing to also provide um, these types of trainings as well to people who work with developmental disabilities in various uh, capacities. So uh, that's what we have in store for today. We're gonna cover um, a brief introduction to some mental health diagnosis that you commonly work with link that with people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. And then we're gonna kind of combine those two topics as we keep in mind how to help with de-escalation um, in those populations. So that's what we have in store for us today. Our objectives, I kind of just previewed those for you. We're gonna gain a better understanding of adults and children who have intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities, their needs for mental health services. Gonna give you a very brief introduction to understanding the prevalence of co-occurring mental illness and developmental disabilities. And then, like I said, we're gonna identify common de-escalation techniques uh, recommended for this population. I believe I have five handouts um, that I'm going to be referencing throughout the training today. Um, I will provide those at the end, um, but I will get them up on the screen so you can reference uh, what it is that I am um, covering. So keep, keep your eye out for those handouts um, at the end. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, why are you here? Why is this important to you and the work that you do? Uh, many of the individuals that you serve not only have intellectual or developmental disabilities, but they may also have mental health disorders, mental health um, diagnosis. And so being aware of what those symptoms are um, can help you recognize them when they're occurring. And I hope um, one of the major things that you take away from today is that oftentimes behaviors or those quote unquote, you know, uh, behaviors that we see or problem behaviors is usually what we mean are often the result of a mental health diagnosis. So knowing this can increase you having a successful interaction um, with people within that population. And we're gonna provide throughout today um, tips, tricks to avoid escalation in the first place or to help somebody to deescalate if they do happen to get um, into a crisis situation. Um, so this is mental, what I call mental health 101. I'm not going to go over every single mental health diagnosis ever. I'm just going to go over the most common ones. So just to kind of keep a general um, mind, mindset that mental health diagnosis um, show up as severe disturbances in a person's behavior, their mood, their thinking is often impaired, as well as their uh, relationships are often affected. So think of it as mental health affecting a person's functioning across all settings. So you're not just depressed, you know, because you have a new job, you, if you have depression, are experiencing symptoms at home. You're experiencing symptoms in your relationships. You're experiencing symptoms from the time you wake up to the time you fall asleep. Um, and maybe it even is impairing your sleep as well. So work, family, social life, all other life areas are impacted by mental health. Um, important to remember that it is your thoughts that are affected, your feelings, as well as behaviors when it comes to mental health um, diagnosis. So I'm going to go over just the very common categories. I'm not getting into psychosis. I'm not getting into schizophrenia. We just do not have time today, unfortunately. So I will just cover um, the most 
commonly seen diagnosis that you may come into contact in your population. And just very generally speaking, we'll start with depression, which could show up as problems eating, sleeping, like I said, interaction with others, relationships. And I think what's hallmarked to depression is people do not enjoy things that they previously enjoyed. It may look like the person is hopeless, helpless. Um, there's no to them, there's no chance that things could improve. Um, they have difficulty concentrating, maybe preoccupied with death and suicide. Also can manifest in some physical symptoms. So physically, they may be having upset stomachs, headache, um, just general body pain, um, digestive issues, um, extreme tiredness, which would be fatigue. Um, so this is not just your everyday feeling, feeling sad or feeling down. This is pervasive. And it goes on for an extended period of time. Um, so like I said, this is just an introduction. So I'm going to hit you real fast with what is the diagnosis. And then I want you to come away from this training with some tips and tricks that you could implement today if you are working with somebody um, with these specific diagnoses. So just off the bat, some real basic um, do's and don'ts for supporting people who have a diagnosis of depression is to do your best to listen without judgment express empathy or try to um, understand where the person may be coming from, what they're experiencing, provide encouragement, let them know that you're listening, let them know that you hear them, uh, making statements like, I'm hearing what you're saying is you're feeling stuck, down, depressed, defeated, wounded, whatever they are um, expressing to you, and then validate their experience. I think once you know these diagnosis um, symptoms, you can then validate and kind of normalize that you know their experience is important, but it is also common for people who have a diagnosis of depression. So those are just some real quick do's, uh, what to avoid, making comments like "be strong," "don't cry," you know, let's focus on the positive, be grateful for what you have. Um, somebody who is very severely depressed is not going to see very many positives, or maybe be able to see any positives at all. Um, so avoid minimizing what they're going through. You know, people all over the world are struggling after the pandemic or people all over the world are struggling with these kind of problems. Get over it. You want to avoid those type of statements or comparisons, comparing them to somebody else. You know, look at your neighbor. They have it so much worse. Also want to avoid telling people that you know exactly how they feel because we do not. Everybody's um, experience of not only depression, but other mental health diagnosis are unique. So we do not know how they feel. We need to have them explain to us or show, the, show us how they are feeling. Um, so we're going to do the same thing for a couple more very common diagnosis. Again, not all of them, but I do want to cover anxiety and really differentiate that anxiety disorders uh, like generalized anxiety disorders, specific phobias, um, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress, um, is not just everyday stress and worry. You know, it's normal for us to be worried on a day-to-day -day basis, but it comes and goes. Anxiety, on the other hand, are pervasive, severe, it lasts longer and again, interferes with all of their day-to-day -day activities, relationships, and affects them in multiple settings. Um, so again, this is this is just very quick. This is not meant to be um, you know, an in-depth coverage of all of these diagnoses, but knowing those symptoms of anxiety, just some very quick things you can do to support that person, as well as things you want to avoid, um, is again, listen without judgment, hear what they're saying, and then express that you hear them. You know, what I hear you saying is you're feeling very worried, you're scared, you're experiencing panic. Validate that again, these are normal symptoms of anxiety, and then ask them for some guidance. How would you like me to support you? Or what could I do to help you to feel better? Show some grace, be forgiving. Um, oftentimes the behavior, the avoidant behavior that we see um, is not somebody being difficult, it's somebody being very scared and experiencing um, severe anxiety. Uh, so the flip side of that is to avoid telling people just to relax, just calm down. That could oftentimes lead to more anxiety because the person cannot control it. If they could calm down or if they could relax, um, they would. You may also want to avoid, you know, asking the person, why are they panicking? Oftentimes, very in-depth discussions of anxiety and panic can cause more panic and anxiety. So you may want to wait um, until they have calmed down 
to ask those types of questions. Um, try your best to avoid getting frustrated. Oftentimes anxiety and panic is out of a person's control. You also do not want to avoid the individual. So I know I just said avoid asking in-depth questions about their panic or anxiety, but the um, kind of other side of that coin is also just don't avoid them. Oh, they're having a panic attack. I'm going to leave them alone. Or, oh, they look really anxious. I'm not going to talk to them today. Um, you want to still be there and provide support, but maybe just avoid probing questions. Um, also may want to avoid bringing up the anxiety very often or very frequently. It could actually induce a panic attack. Instead, let them tell you when they're feeling anxious. Let them tell you what they need um, in the moment if they happen to be having um, an intense panic attack or um, an intense uh, instance of anxiety. Um, so these are just the very common ones. Depression, anxiety. I'm going to touch quite a bit today on trauma. Um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is when somebody has um, these symptoms to the extent that it warrants a mental health diagnosis. So I will talk about both people who have had trauma histories, as well as people who formally meet criteria um, for PTSD. I want to be clear um, that uh, this does not include people who've had traumatic brain injuries. That is a whole separate um, diagnosis, but typically trauma occurs in individuals who've experienced a disturbing event where their life or somebody else's life um, is in danger or is in perceived danger. Common um, instances of trauma could be abuse, neglect, accidents, natural disasters, car accidents are very common um, types of instances where um, PTSD could occur. Once they have experienced that traumatic event, you know, days, weeks, months later, those traumatic memories, those traumatic experience could be triggered then again by hearing loud noises, witnessing another traumatic event, being in a different type of traumatic event, or even watching um, disturbing news reports and many other things could re-trigger uh, feelings of, of trauma. What this may look like in somebody who has a trauma history or somebody who actually meets formal criteria for um, post-traumatic stress disorder might look like them avoiding situations, experiences, people who trigger those responses, losing interest in relationships and activities, um, or to, um, it can also be described as a constant feeling of on edge, almost a way of the person trying to protect themselves from being re-traumatized or from being um, in danger again, may also see uh, frequent shifts in their mood. And I'm gonna get much more um, in detail about particularly trauma, because that tends to also um, correlate with people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities as well. Um, so how we want to kind of keep in mind this interactive impact of trauma is um, that there is a correlation between people who've had um, abuse, neglect histories on their brain development. Um, the more prolonged the abuse or neglect, the more likely that that permanent brain damage um, is going to occur. I'm gonna show you some brain scans here in a second to really illustrate this point. And once you see those pictures, you're really gonna see how it's possible for some individuals who've been exposed to trauma at an early age to have their IQ negatively impact um, by as much as 10%. Um, wanna keep in mind, especially with the people you're supporting, that not only are people with developmental disabilities more likely to be exposed to trauma because they are just vulnerable, but exposure to trauma then makes developmental delays more likely. Um, and let me go ahead and show these next couple of pictures to kind of illustrate that exact point um, that I'm talking about. So here is a brain scan of a healthy adult, a person who has not experienced an extensive um, trauma history. What we see here is lots of activation in the brain, lots of areas of the brain are lighting up, pretty much all areas of the brain are lighting up and being activated uh, because they have not experienced any trauma and not had any sort of negative impact um, on their brain development. Um, what you see here are those circles around the uh, temporal lobes. And when I compare that to the next picture, um, you're gonna see why that is circled. Um, what those two circles are indicating is that all areas of the brain are connected. There is not a disconnect um, between all of the areas of the brain working sort of in concert with one another. Uh, so keep this picture in mind of a healthy 
adult brain um, compared with somebody who has experienced um, abuse. This is a um, PET scan from a person who was institutionalized since birth. And this really shows the effect um, that that can have later in life. So what we see here is less activation. And we also see that the areas of the brain are not connected. There is a clear <laughs> disconnect um, between the temporal lobe of the brain, the frontal lobe of the brain um, is responsible for um, decision-making, um, thinking clearly, being able to communicate. And that is very much disconnected from the rest of the brain in this person who has experienced abuse. So um, keep this in mind, both with children that you work with, as well as adults, that what has happened to them maybe in their past is affecting their ability um, to have um, you know, clear thoughts, clear communication because of that disconnect between the frontal lobe and the other areas of the brain. I also wanna show this picture, which I don't think can be even more clear about the impact of abuse, neglect, trauma on the developing brain. Uh, what you see here are two children, both three years old. Um, the image on the left is a quote unquote normal brain or the brain of a child who has not experienced extreme neglect. And then the brain image on the right hand side is that of another three year old child who has experienced extreme neglect in their lifetime. So you can see clear as day, the person on the left is already behind and not um, only their emotional development most likely, but the physical development of their brain has been stunted. And just imagine how that would affect them you know, years down the road if they're already behind in the physical development um, of their brain. So I think that illustrates the point even more than I can say to you on um, this last point on the slide here that um, abuse and neglect have profound influences on brain development. And the um, more often it occurs, um, the more likely it is that that brain development and that brain damage uh, is going to be long lasting throughout their lifetime. I did want to touch on that physical part of the brain that people um, may experience early in life and then affect them later on. Um, just kind of quickly, other common categories of mental health disorders um, could be substance use disorder, keeping in mind that people with mental health disorders are at a higher risk for substance use or abuse um, because it does provide temporary relief to use a substance to escape uh, the, the, those problems at the moment, but it is not a long-term solution. Uh, when it turns into actual abuse is when the person is experiencing guilt, difficulty keeping up with their responsibilities, personally and professionally. They have an inability to control their emotions, um, and that increases their substance intake. So I'm not going to go too much into detail about substance use disorder um, today, but I did want to mention that some other common categories of mental health disorder are to consider um, what would put somebody at risk for suicide, um, which obviously has an impact on mental health, people who experience chronic pain, people who are experiencing challenges managing unhealthy habits, smoking, drinking, but maybe don't meet criteria for substance use, um, abuse, or um, uh, excuse me, substance use disorder. They may not formally meet that criteria. Um, other risk factors for suicide could be experiencing insomnia or having past suicide attempts. So I did, I did want to mention that. Okay, so now we're going to kind of get into the crossover between mental health diagnosis and intellectual and developmental disabilities um, by giving you some statistics. And um, also want to reference specific statistics um, for the state of Ohio. Um, so approximately one out of three people with intellectual and developmental disabilities will also have a mental illness. One out of every five people in the general population will experience a mental health um, diagnosis, mental health problem in their lifetime. I did focus um, earlier on anxiety and mood disorders because those are twice as common in clients who have um, intellectual or developmental disabilities than the general population. So that's why I'm not getting into all of the diagnosis, just keeping it to the ones that may impact the population that you work with um, the most. Um, specifically looking at Ohio and mental health diagnosis and intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, as of 2021, 28% 
of adults in Ohio have some type of disability, and that statistic comes from the CDC. And almost half of those individuals will also have a co-occurring diagnosis of depression. So works out to be 49% or 1,279,334 individuals in Ohio. And I do want to note that Ohio statistics are slightly higher um, than the national average. Um, the national average is 27% and Ohio is actually at 28%. So just as wanted to give you some um, statistics for what is actually going on in the state of Ohio when it comes to mental health and intellectual and developmental disabilities. There is definitely a crossover. Um, there's many contributing factors as to why there are higher rates of mental health diagnosis um, in the intellectual and developmental disability population. These are just some, again, these are generalities, but as I'm talking, I hope maybe you're thinking of some people in your caseload or some clients you support, or maybe those that you supervise support and think about what is um, that sort of cross-section as to why there is a higher rate. Um, they may be experiencing lower levels of social support, fewer friends, may have poorly developed social skills, um, leading to maybe less social support. Um, this population may have learned a sense of learned helplessness. You know, somebody's going to step in and help me, or somebody's going to step in and do this for me, which may um, contribute to a sense of loss of control or um, just a sense of uh, not being able to change, you know, things in their life, not being able to work on their symptoms. Uh, maybe um, experiencing low socioeconomic level and everything that goes along with that. Um, we do note an increased presence of physical disability. So not just um, intellectual and developmental disabilities, but also as a comorbidity with physical disabilities, um, noting especially epilepsy. Uh, maybe experiencing heightened family stress, heightened maternal stress because of the intellectual disability, because of the physical disability. So just a lot of uh, stress surrounding the person, maybe leading to that abuse or neglect that we talked about earlier. Some other factors um, in this population, increased likelihood of central nervous system damage, maybe from a traumatic birth or some other um, kind of condition, increased presence of reading and language dysfunctions, um, having less of an opportunity to learn adaptive coping, coping styles, excuse me. So maybe because of their learning disability, um, they are unable to learn traditional, quote unquote, traditional coping styles and uh, may not have those coping styles adapted to what their needs are. Increased likelihood of chromosomal abnormalities, metabolic diseases and infections. So again, that crossover between physical health, mental health, emotional health for sure. And then like I've already um, reiterated a couple of times, there's an increased likelihood of experiencing early trauma and abuse. So that is a lot. I just read two slides full of contributing factors um, of mental health diagnosis to the population of people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. So imagine experiencing these factors, you know, being of a low socioeconomic status, um, lack of support from friends or family. And then on top of it, you know, experiencing mental health diagnosis. So no wonder almost that there is that correlation between mental health diagnosis and having an intellectual or developmental disability. Um, some other things that you may wanna keep in mind when it comes to mental health and people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities is they may experience or express, <clears throat> excuse me, their symptoms differently. Um, so I gave you the common symptoms of anxiety, I gave you the common symptoms of depression, but it may show up differently um, in this population. So keep in mind that individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities may experience depression um, sort of rather than, um, you know, ruminating silently, they may be speaking it out loud. They may be telling you these symptoms of depression that they're experiencing, but it may just look and sound a little bit different may also appear more as irritation or agitation, anger, as opposed to sadness when we're talking about depression, maybe angry, aggressiveness, self-injurious behaviors could also be more commonly displayed among this population. Other things to keep in mind is they may need a referral for mental health diagnosis. Most clients with intellectual and developmental, developmental disabilities um, do not refer themselves for services. They need, need somebody to step in and notice 
these symptoms and then refer them. What it might look like or what the reason for referral um, often is, is non-compliance with staff, temper, quote unquote, temper tantrums, um, self-abuse, self-injurious behavior, um, or sort of going off with no provocation. Um, you know, this behavior happened out of nowhere, or this person got upset and angry and punched a wall, and we don't know why. That could be a very common reason for mental health referral. Um, so keep in mind that clients with intellectual and developmental disabilities who have these types of behaviors may, may actually be experiencing depression and also have histories of trauma. So today I'm really gonna challenge you to kind of look beyond the behavior and not think, oh, this person's being difficult or this person is just giving me a hard time. It may be what happened to them in their past could also be a symptom of a mental health diagnosis. Uh, so some more information about trauma that I think is important to keep in mind if you're supporting this population is children with intellectual um, and developmental disabilities can be between three and six times more likely to suffer abuse than neurotypical children. So it's sort of like, which comes first? You know, does the trauma cause the disability? Does the disability make them more susceptible to the trauma? Sometimes it's hard to tell. Um, also remembering that women with mild intellectual disabilities are actually about five times more likely to suffer sexual abuse than women without disabilities. So again, think of your caseload, think of who you support. Does this describe anybody that you're currently working with? Excuse me. Um, so not only are individuals with developmental disabilities more likely to be exposed to trauma, but like I said, exposure to trauma makes developmental delays more likely. Remember back to those pictures of the brain that I showed you. Um, severe neglect can result in reduced brain size, can also reduce the density of neurons, so less neurons firing in the brain. And like you saw in that picture, a smaller actual physical size of their brain, a smaller head circumference. Um, so this is one of the handouts that I'm providing with you today. I will put it in the chat at the end. I think this is a great handout to review, even if you've been through trauma-informed trainings before. Um, trauma-informed means that we as a provider are aware just of the vulnerability of the population that we serve. And even if we don't know what their trauma history is, it is likely they, they have experienced trauma of some sort. So if you can come from a trauma-informed place, um, this can be very helpful when it comes to de-escalation or can actually prevent um, somebody from becoming um, escalated or from a crisis occurring. So I'll just highlight a couple of things on this handout and I'll provide the entire handout to you at the end. So being trauma informed, being aware of trauma means that you're asking questions of the client, like, um, you know, what happened to you? What happened in your past? You know, what, what have you experienced as far as trauma? Non-trauma informed would be asking questions like, what's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? Why are you acting that way? That is completely ignoring the impact of trauma. Uh, being trauma informed means that you come to training such as this, you recognize just the high prevalence of trauma in the population that you support. Non-trauma informed is not coming to these types of trainings, not being aware or ignoring um, the prevalence of trauma. We'll do a couple more here and then I'll leave the handout for you at the end to review on your own time. Now, trauma informed means that we ask questions, we assess for trauma histories, we assess for these type of symptoms. Non-trauma informed, we're not asking the questions, we don't care. Um, we're looking at other uh, contributing issues to the, to the person's presenting problem and not looking at trauma. So I will, like I said, leave this handout for you in the chat. Um, this is just a great way to maybe assess yourself. Am I coming from a trauma-informed approach? Could I be more trauma-informed perhaps? So very good um, way to self-assess as a, as a provider. Um, so how you would implement this as a provider, mental health professionals or providers such as yourself should be aware um, of this initiative, which I believe you probably should be, um, as it was enacted um, statewide by the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities called the Positive Culture Initiative. I'm not gonna say too much more about that. You may already be familiar with it. If you're not, um, please ask your supervisor or ask, ask a colleague. But this is an example of a trauma-informed approach. It's coming from um, a background of being aware of trauma, asking questions, being sensitive to it. 
Um, another sort of trauma-informed approach that you may want to look more into that I do not have time to cover in depth today is an approach called gentle teaching. Um, and I will provide you a handout on that, but just very quickly, gentle teaching is a way to be trauma-informed by expressing unconditional love, there are four um, teaching purposes involved in gentle teaching to help people feel safe, to help, pe help people feel loved, to help people learn to love and to be engaged. So the handout I'm going to provide to you will give you more details on how to enact this um, perspective of gentle teaching if you are working uh, with this population. Um, so just other great tips that you may need as you're working with this population is to adapt the services you provide. You may be interacting with them in a different way. Um, you may be helping them to label their emotions. For example, say things like, you look sad when you talk about how sick your grandmother is, and then clarify and confirm that with the client. Um, please also adapt by using um, pictures, maybe a feeling faces to help them identify their own emotions. If they're able to journal, that is often very helpful. They could also use picture journals um, to sort of put pictures to their feelings, may also benefit from expression through music. So please feel free to adapt and approach um, this population in a different way. Um, some real quick do's and don'ts. Don't push clients to disclose any details of their traumatic experiences as they are comfortable. They will share. Please do not doubt or disbelieve the client's account of the traumatic experience. Um, don't assume people with a trauma history are automatically going to be violent. Usually that is not the case. Um, but what you, what you do want to do is validate, validate, validate their experience, listen to it create an environment that is that supports them to feel safe and ask them maybe what they would need to feel safe. Uh, reserve judgment and work on positive affirmations to um, improve the therapeutic relationship that you have or the working relationship that you have with that person. So just a couple of reminders to kind of summarize, especially that handout about trauma-informed care. Change your thinking from what happened, you know, what's wrong with you, you know, why are you doing this to maybe what has happened to you. So maybe change the questions that we're asking. We're gonna get at the end into uh, analyzing behavior, remembering that all behavior has meaning and that these problem behaviors we see in front of us may actually be as a result of trauma or maybe as a result of a mental health diagnosis. Uh, remembering that symptoms of trauma are very often an adaptation on the part of that person to survive. You know, them running away, them avoiding could absolutely be a survival skill to not experience trauma again. Uh, please, please, please remember and remind your client that the effects of trauma is a normal response to an abnormal experience. So it can be very helpful to normalize a person's um, trauma response. And our goal as people who support this population is to help people to find healthier ways to cope. And that is a big part of the de-escalation I'm gonna get into at the very end here. Um, something else, if you're interested uh, when it comes to working with this population is we may actually need to teach or help our clients to learn what facial expressions need. So I will provide this um, also in my references if you're interested in learning more about this, but there is this idea that there are seven universal emotions kind of across cultures, across countries um, that people can recognize disgust, contempt, sadness, happiness, fear, anger, and surprise. Those facial expressions are very common and consistent from culture to culture, but we may need to teach our clients what do facial expressions mean to interpret them or maybe help them learn um, how to use those basic um, facial expressions. So I'm not going to go into too much more detail there. That is a whole other training in and of itself, but it is a definitely a useful um, part of understanding your clients, helping them to understand themselves as well as um, use in de-escalation. I also did want to spend a couple slides um, talking about sexuality and maybe looking at sexualized behaviors in a different way in this population. Just a couple of reminders that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have sexual desires, just like everybody else, uh, may involve us as providers being aware of our own personal beliefs and understanding those, maybe um, supporting the client to advocate or self-advocate on their own half to getting these needs met, and thinking about sexualized behaviors as also a form of communication and not necessarily a quote unquote problem behavior. So I'll challenge you just kind of quickly today, instead of thinking of the particular sexual behaviors you see on the left, 
think of an alternative explanation. So the person that you see stripping may actually be having a sensory issue. They're too hot, they're too itchy. A person exposing themselves may actually need to go to the bathroom. Um, somebody engaging in masturbation, depending on the setting, could be bored or frustrated, or it could be a self-soothing attempt. Uh, people engaging in inappropriate touch, maybe don't understand boundaries or never had boundaries um, taught to them. And requests for hugs and kisses could actually be the person expressing a need for physical contact or kind of reaching out for support. So um, this is a great lead in to helping de-escalation because I'm going to really challenge you here in a moment to look at behaviors in an alternative way, not just sexualized behaviors, but uh, behaviors in general. Um, so I'm going to start with this great video. I don't think it is that long, um, but I think it illustrates well a um, great starting point for de-escalation and helping people to um, come back down to their baseline if they're headed towards a crisis or if they're actually in a crisis. So let's go ahead and play this and then I will catch you on the other side. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing- You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. Okay, I love that video. I think it illustrates well. Um, a great starting point for de-escalation or working with people who are having problem behaviors, working with people um, who may be headed towards a crisis in that oftentimes we want to fix the problem or we want to find out what the problem even is. That's not often where people need us to be. They may need us to listen. They may need us just to be there and not to tell them how to solve the problem. So um, that's a great lead in to my very quick de-escalation um, overview, I want to let you guys know that people who go through either an anger arousal cycle or really any other strong emotional arousal cycle tend to go through the same steps in the same order. It may look different from person to person, um, but they typically go through these five steps and they usually go through these five steps in order, starting with um, the trigger phase. There is an event or something in our environment that causes us to feel threatened and our body is preparing us to um, protect ourselves or to run away or to somehow you know stay alive it's almost a survival technique which then um, leads to the escalation phase it could be physically experiencing an increased heart rate it could be physically experiencing an increased breathing rate um, muscles are tensing for action um, you may feel um, itchy feet is how I describe it. We're getting ready to run away, or maybe we're getting ready to fight, but that is the escalation phase. Um, the crisis phase is when we are prepared to take action. Um, we may be unable to handle the level of stress in that situation is another great way to describe crisis. Our normal coping skills aren't working. My normal attempts to slow down my breathing, my normal attempts to deal with that trigger are not working for whatever reason, and that sends me into crisis. I'm unable to handle the situation that I normally could handle. Uh, the recovery phase then um, is when 
um, the body starts to recover from the extreme stress and that expenditure of energy. So our body can only have adrenaline pumping through it for so long. Our blood pressure can only be raised for so long. Our heart can only you know, be pounding for so long. So the recovery phase is the body sort of coming down the other side of the mountain is how I think of it. And then the post-crisis um, or often called the depression phase is the last phase. So that is when um, awareness returns, energy returns to normal levels, and we can finally assess what has just happened. So it is an important part of the cycle because a lot can be learned once somebody has de-escalated. You know, what was it that triggered you? Um, maybe why weren't your normal coping skills working? Why did you actually progress through escalation and into crisis? What could we do different next time? Could we avoid that trigger? If we can't avoid that trigger, what other new coping skills could we put into place? So I think once you understand your person that you're trying to support and how they go through this particular cycle, that's another great way to approach um, de-escalation is to really understand um, and observe what they're experiencing. Um, keeping in mind always that behavior is two things. It's a way to communicate. Usually it's a way to communicate an unmet need or they're using their behavior in an attempt to get that unmet need met. Um, so if I'm, if I'm hungry, I have learned maybe over time that I can communicate I'm hungry by banging my plate on the table, banging my silverware on the table. If that gets me food, I'm gonna continue to bang my plate and bang my silverware on the table to get food when I'm hungry. Um, so that's a very basic way of thinking about behavior, but I, again, I encourage you to maybe not take behavior personally, not that this person is attacking me, this person is manipulating me, but they're actually trying to communicate something to me and perhaps get an unmet need um, met. Um, so what we can do to either prevent a crisis from occurring or um, to reduce the likelihood that somebody progresses up the cycle all the way into a crisis is to control what we can when it comes to triggers. We may have some control over the environment um, if they are triggered by certain noises, could we go to a quieter place? Um, if they are triggered by smells, um, could we switch the type of cleaning, you know, cleaning supplies that we use? What can we control in the environment to reduce the likelihood that somebody goes into trigger is a great um, de-escalation technique is also a great way to prevent a crisis from occurring. Um, another thing we can look at when it comes to controlling triggers is your interactions. You know, I'm not blaming us as providers, but think about for a moment, am I playing any part in a person becoming escalated? Is it my tone of voice? Am I getting too close to them in their personal space bubble? Um, am I using words that are triggering? Is there anything about our interaction that I have control over that I could stop doing or that I could adjust in some way? Um, are they not a morning person? Would it be better to have this conversation after they've had lunch in the afternoon. A lot of these things we do have control over once we recognize them. And then the better you know your client, the better you can be patient specific in controlling triggers. Um, you know, once you've asked questions about what is triggering, we can then avoid those sounds, those smells, those situations, those words um, as a way to control uh, triggers and hopefully decrease the likelihood that a person actually goes into crisis. Uh, some other great tips. Um, some core principles of de-escalation is to stay in the moment. You know, now when a person is in their crisis phase is not the time to remind them, oh, you were supposed to take out the garbage or last week you said you would um, do X, Y, Z or remind them that they have a doctor's appointment in two weeks. Now, stay in the moment right now, not talking about the past, not talking about the future. Um, take note of the moments surrounding a peak escalation. What was it that triggered them? What was it that sent them over the edge? Maybe what's influencing their ability um, to use their coping skills. Um, sometimes we teach clients coping skills like run away or get out of the situation, you know, leave the room, which is fine as a coping skill. But what if they're in a car? Or what if they're in a situ situation that they can't escape? Maybe that is a contributing factor to them not being able to use their skills to de-escalate themselves. Here in a moment, we're gonna talk more about empathy, but please um, use empathy rather than sympathy. We want to try to identify with how the person is feeling. How might I feel if I was in that situation? Address the behavior, not the person. This is not a bad person. This is a person um, who cannot cope in a situation, or this is a person who has been triggered. This is not a, an evil you know, person, so to speak. 
Um, remembering that escalation up into the crisis phase typically occurs due to an individual's beliefs about a situation or that triggering or activating event, not usually the event itself. So this is why the post-crisis phase is so important to understand what did they believe? Did they think that they were in danger when they really weren't? Did they misinterpret something in their environment um, and maybe go through that with the person to prevent a crisis from occurring again in the future? Um, very important in that um, nail video that we just watched. People often um, need to feel heard or cared about before they can move on from a crisis. The lady with the nail in her head did not want to go into problem solving mode. She did not want the gentleman to start solving her problem for her. She wasn't quite ready for that. She just wanted him to hear her. He just want, she just wanted him to listen to her. So using statements of validation, empathy, allow a client, a patient to feel heard and understood using statements of assistance, showing that you care and showing that you are concerned. So again, not focused on uh, them being bad or this being a bad situation, but I'm concerned about you. I want to help you. Um, I'm here to help you. Uh, we can also do quite a bit, maybe not in the moment when a person is actually in crisis, but maybe afterwards or even some preventative measures could be to normalize the stress response and maybe help it to feel less scary when somebody is in a crisis. That when people are stressed, it is actually normal to experience things like tunnel vision or tunnel hearing, to not be able to think clearly. Um, when we are overwhelmed with emotions, the frontal lobe of our brain really shuts down and we may, not, may, we may not be able to think or communicate like we normally do. They may experience physically uh, what we call vasoconstriction or that shaky feeling, their legs may be shaking, their hands may be shaking. That actually is a normal stress response as well as experiencing time differently. It may feel like time is going by very quickly or it may feel as though time has stood still. So once you can sort of explain that to a person, being within a crisis and experiencing those things may not be as scary. Uh, we can normalize and help the person to understand the relationship between their beliefs and emotions. Maybe they misinterpreted something that caused them to go into crisis. Recognizing that people typically have more control, again, over those beliefs than they do over the emotions themselves. Um, our goal as somebody supporting somebody in crisis is to respond not to react. So this involves us sort of checking ourselves and having a thoughtful, a planned out, a premeditated response versus just reacting in the moment that could sometimes come off as uncaring um, or kind of a knee jerk reaction to somebody and saying things like, calm down, you know, what's wrong with you? Knock it off. That's not helpful um, when somebody is experiencing a crisis. Um, I've mentioned empathy a couple times. It is so important. Um, I think this is going to be one of the very last things we talk about because I want you to remember this idea of empathy. Um, what empathy is, is staying out of judgment, taking another person's perspective, recognizing the emotion that that person is experiencing, then experiencing and then communicating to them what you recognize or what you're noticing. Um, so not judging the situation they're in, thinking for a moment, what must it be like to be that person? You know, what must it be like to have lost you know, my brother or sister? Recognizing the grief, recognizing the emotion in that situation, and then telling the person, this must be difficult for you. I understand that you lost your brother. That must be a very difficult time uh, for you to be going through right now. Um, so I have this little video that I want to play. You may have seen it before. It's a very common video about empathy, but I really have not found a better video to demonstrate what empathy is and how it is very different from sympathy. Sympathy is feeling bad for somebody. Empathy is taking their perspective to how might they be feeling in that situation or how would I feel if I was in that situation. So I'm going to play this and then I will catch you on the other side. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. 
recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least, you know, you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Okay. So I did kind of want to end on that or at least have that be one of the last things that we talk about, like I said, because I want you to sort of take that away as being one of the most important things from this training. If, you know, no matter what the diagnosis, no matter what the intellectual or developmental disability, um, if we're working on supporting somebody going through a difficult time, uh, we cannot go wrong using empathy. And they look different from person to person, you know, how we express that or how we implement that. Um, but honestly, that is my biggest um, de-escalation technique um, is to just apply empathy and think about uh, from the other person's perspective, what it is that they may be going through, which is often the first step towards helping them to de-escalate. Once they've been heard, once you've communicated that we've heard them, that is a great um, sort of segue into helping the person to deal with the crisis, to de-escalate, hopefully learn something from it, and prevent um, a crisis from occurring again in the future, hopefully. Um, so we do have about five minutes left. I did wanna leave time for questions and comments. And I also wanted to make sure that you could open uh, the attachments that I put in the chat. You may need to download them before you can open them, but let me know if you're having issues with that and I could probably share them um, another way. But just five minutes, questions, comments, concerns. Um, did this bring up anything for you? About and can, that you you support. Send, can you send me the um the slides and the uh, handouts and I will get them to everybody who's here oh, in sure. person so they don't have yeah, to do out of the chat. Yeah, awesome. No problem. Okay. Well, if anybody in on Zoom wants to unmute and ask a question or put it in the chat, and then I will be kind of like the louder moderator for people <laughs> here. Anybody in okay. here has a question. Sure. In here, people seem like they're okay. Okay. Um, like I said, this was very quick. This was like four, four trainings mixed into one. If you want any one of these, please let us know. I have no problem. I'm spending more time on each of these topics, um, but I think it was a great intro, a good starting point for all of those topics, mental health, um, intellectual development disabilities, as well as de-escalation. Awesome. Well, if everybody's good on both sides, we appreciate your time very much. Um, and that was a good way to get us started and give us some things to think about and talk about. So I really appreciate you and your time. No problem. And I recorded this too. So if people want the recording. Oh, um, yeah. Can you? I'll give, um, I'll give either Emily or, or you. Um, I'll give you a YouTube link to the video if people weren't able to come. Yes, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. All right, we got a comment that says great info and thanks. Okay. So thank you.
you again. Okay. Well, we do have a couple minutes if anybody has any questions or comments or Emily, if you wanted to say anything, go ahead. And if you do have any questions about our psychiatric services, my email is my name. So it's emily.maring at viaquestinc.com. So if you have any questions about any clients that you think might need either medication management services or potentially counseling or therapeutic behavioral support, I'm more than happy to talk about that. And then we can get you our referral form and get them situated with our services. Thanks. And we know where to find both of you because I have both of your emails. So perfect. Awesome. Anyone who wants that, we we have it. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank right. you. Thank have you a great all. day. Have a good rest of your day, guys. Bye. Bye.